And that's the way you command your morning. That's the way you command your day. Some kind of way. It's going to be all right. It's going to be okay. You speak life into your life okay thank you very much for that gentle reminder canton jones something called be all right bringing us to an all right position inside our number two of the breakfast round table for today tuesday february the 6th 2018 it's 12 minutes after seven o'clock and the other big story that everyone is talking about you know defaming people in social media uh giving your mouth too much liberty well we're going to be putting the spotlight on that right about now with the help of our trusty friend and possibly future High Court Judge Martin George, member of the Police um, Service Commission and a senior attorney at law. Good morning to you, Martin George. Hi, good morning to you, Jesse May, and good morning to your listeners. Good morning, Edison. Oh, he's he's not he's good under morning, the weather. Your Honor. But oh, um, Dr. Dr. Wayne is with us. <laughs> the man who prophesied that you would make it to the High Court of benches. Of course. If you want and when you want. Yeah? <laughs> We, we know we know you like the cut and thrust of, of, of everyday lawyering. Yeah, 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 yeah. The advocacy is, is really, you know. What the love is real. Out. The passion is real. Yeah. Speaking of advocacy, what do you think of this judgment with regard to, you know, um, um, the defamation? Oh, I'm very, very happy about it, Jeremy, mm-hmm. because it's something that I've been speaking about, I've been writing about it, That's I've been right. talking about it, and it appears that persons still are not, you know, recognizing the seriousness or importance to be, you know, um, responsible and careful in terms of what you see. Now, the thing is, it's not that you can't say things on social media, you know, because I saw somebody who quite misguidedly um, mm-hmm. took offense when I, um, you know, issued a caution like that and said, um, we're trying to muzzle the media, muzzle the press, muzzle freedom of speech. No, it's not a matter of that. The point is, defamation laws have always existed to protect the reputations of persons from, you know, unnecessary, false and injurious statements which can do damage to their characters and reputations, which sometimes can turn out to be irreparable damage. You, you know, know, I mean, just this morning I was looking at a newspaper, uh, a, a newspaper article where the president-elect had to be answering questions about things that were circulating about her on the internet. Hmm. You know, and I mean, she had to come out and, you know, give a, a, a definite answer to the Guardian in relation to a certain question. You know, and I mean... Isn't that awful? I, I, I've seen where people have run with this thing and, you know, they, they've made it like, you know, fact. And, you know, it, it's unbelievable the recklessness and carelessness that people, you know, seem to think that the anonymity of, you know, typing something, sitting at home in, your, with, in front of your computer, that that can protect you. The point is, once it can be traced as to who is the source of, of the post, then you can be held liable for your defamatory statement. But, but, but Ma- George. Martin George, you know, why, why do people think that freedom of speech means that you can do and say whatever you want? Isn't, well, isn't, it, isn't it, it, the, the it, under, underlying... It's right, you know. People seem to think that you can have a right without responsibility. And I've always said, the greater the right, the greater the responsibility attached to it. And when you think of the power of social media, the power of the internet, the reach, you know, because say for instance, you can never know with certainty all the persons who would have read your post. You may have persons in, you know, Italy, in Australia, in China, reading your post and maybe believing some of the things you say. And if the things you say are false, misleading, and defamatory, then the damage to that person's character is being done all over the world in different parts that, that, you know, I mean, as I say, it's really irreparable because you could never track down to know everybody who was affected by it and who may harbor negative feelings. It might be people people right here in Trinidad and Tobago. Mm -hmm. Some folks may not tell you anything about it, but they may just treat you differently. They may look at you differently. They may tell their friends, well, you know, be careful of that person because I read so-and-so about Uh them on the internet. And that's the danger of the defamatory statement. It It is one of the most damaging and insidious forms 
of harm that you can inflict on somebody. As you make that point, you know, people seem to think that whatever they see online is a gospel. That's that's one thing. And people also seem to think that when they post something online that they are invisible and cannot be found. Let's deal with that. Those are two things that, that I think are two common misconceptions. Because you can trace in many cases or track down to see where it came from. You can go to the internet service provider or whoever. You could go to Facebook. I mean, Facebook, they have their policies in terms of how they try to guard content. But you see, they, they have very specific rules. So therefore, you may not run afoul of their rules, but you could end up defaming somebody by making false and misleading statements about them. So the, the essence of it, Jessica, maybe if we go to the definition of defamation, yes, so that please. you can understand. Mm-hmm. Right? Defamation of character is often used to describe accusations of slander, libel, or both. Slander involves verbal derogatory statements. So in other words, if I say it out in public, if I speak it, then that's slander. And if I write it, then it becomes libel. So in other words, written or typed statements, those would um, fall under the definition of um, defamation by libel. Now, the thing is, you must... The fundamental thing is that for it to be defamatory, it must be untrue. In other words, if you say something bad about somebody that is true and you can prove it to be true, there's no defamation. You know, it may not be nice to say it, <laughs> yeah. you know, but the point is once it's true, that's a perfect defense to any action for defamation. That's your first line of defense. You can, if you can prove, hey, listen, as bad as it may sound, what I said is true and here's the proof. At the end of it, nobody could see you for defamation. So it has to be something that is untrue. Now, the thing is, you can make your untrue statement either by direct statement or you can have defamation by implication or defamation by insinuation. So in other words, you don't have to necessarily come out and say, you know, something about somebody. But say, for instance, you can make an insinuation, say, for instance, about their sexual orientation or something of the sort. Which is what you happened know? with our president-elect. Right. You see, and, and I mean, that is, it is defamatory. Mm-hmm. I, I, am, I am appalled and I am saddened to think that, you know, the highest office in the land is not immune from this type of social attack and stigma that people, you know, mm-hmm. take liberty and just, you know, cast aspersions wildly and recklessly with, with no, no, no thought to the consequences or, you know, anything of the sort. And we have to put a stop to that. We have to understand that you cannot go about saying these things and think that there's no consequence to your actions. Mm-hmm. But, you know, Mr. George, you've already always schooled me, and I've learned from you, uh, from the legal perspective here, uh, in terms of evidence can you prove it can you prove it mm-hmm. with this the, the social media i mean you, you painted the picture you can go into you know one of the they can go into the archives as it were um one of the the the, the uh, providers and 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 probably um from a legal perspective you 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 make you a summons as the case might be mm-hmm. right but but and, can and, you and, prove it and, and and that's the other thing people right. think that even if you so, pull it down out of cyberspace that it's gone. It it is never gone. It is uh, never lost. Right. So, so right, let's deal with those two things. First of all, um, they, they, if you notice from, I mean, if you just browse social media, you'd realize actually most of the people who go about saying reckless, damaging, defamatory things, they actually don't even hide their identities. So there's no doubt that it's you that came from your account because you've been posting, posting on the internet. You, you, a lot of them are serial posters on the internet, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, but if it's a generic, a, a generic statement... Whatever they, they, they want to, you know, muddy the waters on the other side. So therefore, you, you, you know the persons, right? Yes. You see them all the time. So therefore, a lot of them don't even hide their identity. Secondly... Even if they attempt to hide their identities, um, one thing I could know, I could say for sure with Facebook, they always try to determine the true identity. So if they recognize that someone is using fake identities, right. they may actually either block that account or they may notify persons who may seek to add them as friends that, look, hey, this person previously had an identity as John Brown. Now they're saying they're Mark Young or, you know, that kind of thing. Yes. So, 
they try to ensure that as much as possible, of course, it can't be 100% perfect, but they try to ensure that as much as possible, the persons whose identities are showing up are really the persons who are doing the posting. But of course, that doesn't prevent persons from using a pseudonym or nom de plume, you know, to do um, their dirty work, in which case you then now have to go to the service provider. Um, Facebook has a thing where you can report the post and um, you could ask for an investigation, that kind of thing. Of course, that yes. takes time. It may take money because, um, you know, I, I guess they, they probably deal with hundreds or thousands of these kinds of um, issues every day. Mm-hmm. But you, you can take steps to try to trace or track down the author or the identity of the person who has issued the defamatory statement. Sometimes there may be links even within the statement, you know, because if it may concern peculiar knowledge or peculiar information, you know, if, for instance, they're making a complaint to say, well, at the house next door to me, um, you know, I I keep hearing, um, like, somebody's interfering with the child, that kind of thing, then, of course, you know, you can now try to identify, well, maybe it might be somebody in your locality, one of your neighbors, that kind of thing, which, um, incidentally, was basically the type of fact situation in this present judgment, that's right, you know, that's where right. someone said that, you know, um, they made an allegation in relation to a family and, you know, how they were treating a child, that kind of thing. And yeah, it turns out that all the allegations were untrue as per the judgment. So we have to be very careful because the courts can then impose um, huge sums in terms of damages that you could be called upon to pay. I will just <clears throat> point out, Jessamy and um, Dr. Ween. This matter, I mean, as sensational as it is, it's not the first cyber defamation claim that was ever brought in Trinidad and Tobago. Eh? We must remember that. Okay. The first cyber defamation claim was filed in 2012, actually six years ago. Right? It was a matter involving Emil Elias and NH International and Eugene Reynolds. Now, in that matter, the courts found that the publication by the defendant did not amount to a defamatory attack, but that also concerned publications on the Internet, which the claimant alleged to be defamatory. However, the court did not find that it was defamatory. So that was actually the first cyber defamation case in Trinidad and Tobago six years ago in 2012. This one uh, is the first one where you have a Mm -hmm. judgment like this where the court has made it absolutely clear, hey, listen, you can be held responsible for your defamatory post over the internet. Mm -hmm. All right. Now, now, um, Martin George, in the in this instant case, an entire family's life was shattered, people's reputations were destroyed, and no amount of money That's awarded right. by the court and, can I mean, you, you, fix you that at, you situation. Look at the, the very nasty nature of the allegations. Yes, you know, I mean these are not things to take lightly, especially when you are dealing with you know people's character, people's credit, and worse yet, involving children. Absolutely, you know. I mean, the, you know the, Think of the stigma, the stain on this child now with this allegation. You know, I mean, per dev, there may be persons who may have heard it, who may have believed it, if, if you understand me. And, 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 and the, the parents. Think to the family, but the point is they just look at them differently, they treat them differently, and that's the danger of defamation. If you remember the matter of Syed Mohammed versus Jack Austin Warner. Yes. When um, certain statements were made by Mr. Warner in the heat of the you know, electioneering, um, he made some allegations about Mr. Mohammed um, in terms of crossing the floor and, you know, what may have motivated him <laughs> to cross the floor yes. um, in the Shaguanas Borough Council. And the court um, made an award, right? They made a finding that Mr. Warner's statement was defamatory, right? That was just a cocoram. And he made an award against Mr. Warner in the sum of $220,000 damages to be paid to Mr. Mohammed as a result of the statement that was made by Mr. Warner. There's also the uh, matter of Trinidad Express newspapers and Craig Greenall and Sunati Maraj and Kamini Maraj versus Conrad Alion. Right. In this matter, the judgment was delivered in 2014, and in relation to that matter, the trial judge found that seven of the articles, this is a series of articles that were published, you know, by the expert newspaper um, in relation to certain things um, concerning Mr. Aliyong, and the court found that 
um, they were defamatory and they ordered general damages in the sum of $650,000 right, should be paid in relation to the defamation. You also have the matter of Professor Courtney Bartholomew versus Dr. Neil Singh. Right. In this matter, you had a scenario where Professor Courtney Bartholomew said that there were certain things which were said about him which were defamatory, mm-hmm. and it was um, in relation to an article. Right, and um, when when it was um, ruled, the, the court ruled that there was defamation, and the defendant had to pay a hundred thousand dollars in damages um, to the claimant. Then you had our, our present Prime Minister, Dr. Keith Christopher Rowley, who says Michael Anisette. If you recall, Mr. Anisette um, made some allegations and claims um, in relation to um, you know, the Prime Minister, and the Prime Minister sued him, and Mr. Anisette was ordered to pay $475,000 in damages um, to the Prime Minister for what he said there. Mm-hmm. You know, so the point is the courts are always very, very, um, you know, vigilant to guard the reputations of persons from unnecessary and unwarranted attacks, mm-hmm. you know. And still in Trinidad and Tobago, I could tell you, our scale of damages is low compared to what you see in some other jurisdictions such as the U.S. and even the U.K. Mm-hmm. I, I want to ask you, uh, Mr. George, okay, so... We we look at the, the, the Parliament channel and so on, and we've heard last week coming out of Tobago, some deflammatory statements were made, uh, let's use the Tobago case, in the Tobago House of Assembly, but they, they, they shouted in, in the, the parliamentary privileges. Why? Why do you, you, they are in the parliamentary privilege, I think you know, the, 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 you, you probably read the, the, the account uh, in Tobago, of, of one of the Secretary of Health, I think she is, Dr. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and she, right, and she made the statement about one of the um, the junior, I think she's a... Um, uh, um, uh, a member it? of the... Of a the, counselor. A counselor, counselor, a counselor yes. that's it, right. Um, so why, why, should, why should that be allowed? Isn't it in the same category? Okay, uh, well, the thing is, you have certain um, exceptions for that defamation. Privilege is one exception. In other words, if something is covered by privilege, then it cannot be defamatory. And but it is. It is. Mis- you know it is, Mr. George. No, the no, lady no, was, it, it was injurious. The statement no, was. No, listen to me. Listen to me. It may be injurious to someone. It may be damaging to their character. But in the law, it's not defamatory because it's covered by the privilege. So you have parliamentary privilege. You also have legal privilege in the sense of an attorney-client instructions or conversation that can never be defamatory. So in other words, and now that one is, is for very good practical reason, because in other words, your client may come to you, give you certain instructions about John Brown, you know, and you now file your claim, making all these allegations against John Brown. Now, if it is that those allegations are not true, then John Brown could <laughs> have immediately turned around and sued the attorney and said, well, you said these things about me. So um, that is protected by legal privilege because that's the confidentiality of instructions between attorney and client. So regardless of whether it's true or not, you can... Put it there in your pleading, in your case, because those are the instructions you got from your client. So that is covered by privilege. Parliamentary privilege, the root and basis and genesis of that is so that you can allow your parliamentarians and your members of parliament in the upper house or the lower house to be able to speak freely in terms of you know, issues affecting the society without fear of being sued for their statements. But I think we have now gone to the extreme, and this comes to the point that you're making, whereby we think that any reckless, you know, um, salacious, derogatory statement um, can pass as parliamentary privilege. In which case, then what you have now, by the rules of Hansard, you can make a complaint and ask for that person to be brought before the Privileges Committee. So therefore, they can be disciplined by the rules of Parliament. Because in other words, you are not supposed to use the cover of parliamentary privilege to go and say all manner of things, you know, 
And this is not the first time. If you remember the infamous statement by Vanilla Toppin um, some time ago where yeah. she made some Absolutely. particularly nasty, yeah. you know, yeah. nasty statements. And, yeah. you know, I mean, absolutely no basis for it. And, I mean, the point is she, she made allegations in relation to the prime minister and his lineage and all sorts yes. of, you know, nasty things she said, you know. Um, and she, she, she thought um, she was, you know, be, being, being cute by doing so. But, I mean, it, it, it was really an abuse of the privilege of parliament, mm-hmm. the things she said. And then, again, as you said in this example with, um, with, um, you know, with Dr. Carrington, um, you know, it's absolutely unforgivable in terms of, you know, um, what she had said and the way she carried about herself, particularly as someone who is the Secretary for Health and Wellness in Tobago. So, you know, even our parliamentarians and our politicians and our leaders ought to guide themselves and, you know, you know, subscribe to a higher standard in terms of their codes of conduct and their behavior, even within the realm of parliamentary privilege. So has this uh, landmark ruling, as it were, opens up, opened up a Pandora's box? Can we expect to see now a lot of uh, people, you know, filing claims against, you know, probably um, their enemies, as it were, um, because of defamatory statements that were said about them? Well, it, it, certainly would be, um, you know, it certainly would give an impetus to persons, I think, on both sides, in that I think it would give an impetus to persons to actually, first of all, be more careful, circumspect, and respectful in terms of what they post, because I think they would now, it would now be clear to everyone that, hey, look, you could get into serious trouble for this. And secondly, if persons still persist and nonetheless decide recklessly to go and make untrue statements, remember that's your first thing, it must be untrue, right? Untrue statements, which are then defamatory of other persons, Mm -hmm. then of course, um, they will now know that they can be sued for it, and persons will now know that they can go to their attorneys and institute actions to seek redress in this regard. So I think it's an excellent judgment. It's something that we needed, you know, to kind of, you know, drive home the point. As I said, it's not the first cyber defamation case, Mm -hmm. but it's the first one where we had a judgment such as this. And I think it certainly helps to open the eyes of the general public to the issue and the responsibility that goes with posting things online. So how far back, in retrospect, how far back can uh, someone who believed, because I think this case was around 2014, if I For defamation, your your statute of limitation is four years. Four years. Okay, that's what I want to establish. Four years. So, yeah, 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 I be- figured so. <laughs> four years. We also had, if you recall, there was also the matter of Robin Montano versus Harry Hanarine and the Hindu Credit Union Communications Limited, where, um, if you remember, Harry Hanarine and his Haiti, mm-hmm. you know, um, was all over the media making all kinds of statements, and he did make some reckless statements against Quite. Mr. Robin Montano, uh, who sued him and... Um, he was um, ordered to pay $250,000. Yes, they had you know, their so days in court. We, we have had quite a history of cases. You had Kenneth Gordon versus Basdeo Pandey. If you recall, that stemmed from the pseudo-racist comment that was made right. um, by Mr. Pandey on the Hustons, um, and Mr. Kenneth Gordon sued him, and that sum was eventually um, awarded in uh, the amount of $300,000 by the Court of Appeal. Um, they varied the earlier judgment. Right? Then you had John Rahel versus TNT News Center. If you recall, um, the Mirror newspaper made certain insinuations, and this is where you have libel by insinuation. Mm-hmm. Because, it, it, um, you know, so therefore, you, it, it's not just always saying something directly about something, mm-hmm. but if, for instance, you make an insinuation that somebody's involved in a certain type of trade, <laughs> in illegal substances, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, then if that's not true, or if you cannot prove what you are saying, then you can be held liable um, for defamation of character. And Mr. John Rahel sued the TNT News Center because they made that type of, you know, um, allegation in relation to him, you know, about being in a certain um, type of business. And um, the court ordered that he 
um, be paid 400,000 for it. Then, of course, you have the matter of the crime watch host, Mr. Ian Allen, right, where he made certain allegations against Sean Sammy, the son of businessman Junior Sammy. And that award was in the sum of $600,000 that Ian Allen was ordered to pay for Mr. Sammy. And you remember, there was a, a further twist to that story because Mr. Allen did not pay the money. And then um, I think he's very... Well, his former good friend, Mr. Omlala, <laughs> who, who used to be his attorney at one time, he then got um, bailiffs and stuff like that, and they went out to levy on Mr. Allen to collect the $600,000. So know, how did... it was eventually paid up. So, in other words, don't think that simply because a judgment has been made against you that you can just um, ignore it. So how does a judge, uh, because uh, uh, they must be guided by, 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 by some some in terms of awarding of damages, because you, you, you've highlighted there are different sums paid to different right. persons. How so do you... You, you look at different things. You look at, first of all, the nature of the statement, um, how damaging it is, you know, um, the, 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 the egregious nature of the allegation, the, the, how untrue it is, if you understand me, mm-hmm. all right, mm-hmm. you know, um, because, okay, like, <laughs> say, for instance, um, and I, I'm just using, you know, our, our local um, parlance and local examples, you know. If you, if you say someone is ugly, that may not be a defamatory statement because at the end of the day, beauty is in the eye of the beholder. Mm-hmm. You know, it may not be a nice thing to say, you know, but the thing is, um, if it is that, it's, if it says a beauty queen who is up for competition and, you know, has no obvious physical defects that you can... Um, observe, and then a fellow competitor goes in the newspaper and does a big um, spread describing her as ugly, then now that you may be able to say, hey, in those circumstances, it's defamatory of her because she's going up for a beauty queen contest. But isn't that also a a case of cyberbullying? Because inherent in in the online defamation, there is also that element of cyberbullying, you know, because these people who are the victims of this defamation were also bullied in cyberspace. They right. were bombarded. Okay, yes. so, so there's that too. There's that too. But the two issues are separate and apart. Eh? We, we need to mm-hmm. understand that. Okay. So in other words, you, you could, as part of your defamation, engage in cyberbullying. But cyberbullying in and of itself is not always necessarily defamation. Okay. So in other words, okay, um, you, you may not be, uh, to use the same type of example I just gave, you may not be the most handsome man in the world. In fact, I remember there was a, a Calypsonian um, that we had that, you know, persons used to um, describe him as, as you know, the, the handsomest Calypsonian, to put it that way. Yes. Right? So the, if someone keeps saying that, um, it may not necessarily amount to defamation, but it could be bullying if they keep, you know, taunting you and teasing you about it. Mm-hmm. You know, so the thing is, we need to understand that there could be a fine distinction to be made between the cyber bullying and cyber defamation. But as I said, cyber defamation can be done so often and so repeatedly that it amounts to cyber bullying also. So in the award of damages, those um, uh, different factors... Those uh, factors int- also, you also look at the status of the of the person who you defame. That's, in other I words, was just coming to ask you that. If, if, if right. you defame a vagrant. Right, exactly. Right. Thank then, you. I was just coming to ask you that question. Yes, mm-hmm. then it's a different type of standard as opposed to if you defame the prime minister or the president. Thank you. And I mean, on that note, um, I must um, tell you from a factual <laughs> um, basis, I actually did a matter whereby um, I was, um, I, I had to, um, write a pre-action protocol letter to a newspaper, right, on behalf of a vagrant who claimed that he was defamed. This was early in my practice, and it was quite interesting mm. because what happens is um, there was um, an incident in Port of Spain where someone was robbed, and then they were eventually shot, and the allegation was that it was a vagrant who, um, you know, was the perpetrator of the crime. And um, my client, uh, his picture was put on the right. front page of the newspaper as the person who, you know, perpetrated the crime. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> some good Samaritans, if I'll put it that way, um, brought him to our office and, you know, he claimed he, well, he wanted, you know, to sue for defamation because they are saying things about his character. 
<laughs> we sent he was well within his rights. We sent letter to the newspaper, and we were busy trying to you know, um, ensure that we negotiate a good settlement for the client. And then, um, you know, a couple of days later, you know, when I'm talking to the persons at the newspaper to try and, you know, find out, well, where are we with the settlement? They were laughing, you know, they say, oh, well, that matter has been resolved. I said, well, how could it be resolved? And I said, yes, man. Um, the man came into us and we gave him a bucket of fried chicken. <laughs> oh, my goodness. How, you see, look how disrespectful. Oh my goodness. <laughs> look how oh my disrespectful. He <laughs> 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 signed off, <laughs> waving all right. <laughs> oh, <laughs> so my goodness. The end of that. But the point is, even a vagrant can claim mm. defamation of character if it is that he's been wrongfully, um, you know, accused of something and if it's not true. So, you know, that, that's the point I'm trying to make. Mm. Uh, M- Martin George, going forward now with with this whole issue, what do you predict or anticipate would be the case in terms of, of matters like these? And, and will the trolls finally, um, will, will they be stopped in their tracks or can we expect the trolls to ramp up their activity? Because as, you, as we started out the conversation, someone said, oh, you want to muzzle everybody and people have right, the right yes, to free this, this speech. Is what I'm you. you know, I mean, I, I, I was so amazed at the, the level of, I mean, ignorance and I mean, uh, it, it mm-hmm. appeared to be downright stupidity because if you're giving out good advice like this, it's not a matter of you trying to, you know, muzzle persons or to stop them saying things. All we're saying is, look, make sure, first of all, that what you're saying is true, mm-hmm. right? Make sure you say it in a manner that is respectful and not defamatory of anybody. And, you know, by all means, you, you have your freedom of speech. You know, but the point is, with the freedom comes the responsibility. Mm-hmm. And I, I think it will take a little while and a few more cases like this for it to sink in with the general public of Trinidad and Tobago. Because even on the radio stations, I mean, people talk about cyber defamation. Listen, our radio station hosts and the callers to their programs have been defaming people for years. You know, you, 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 yeah. you hear the most atrocious and awful things on some of the radio stations. Not this station, you know, but I mean, certainly some of the others where they cater for a certain demographic or a certain um, segment of the population. They, they say a whole, whole sorts of things. And yeah. a lot of it is motivated by political alignments or political biases. One and they way also the want other. to get and ratings. They, they think that there's a license to just you know, make all kinds of nasty allegations against people. And it, it, it's not right. It cannot be right. And I hope we see more and more of these actions so that people get the message and understand there's nothing wrong with you having your freedom of speech. But with that right comes the responsibility to ensure that you do not defame or do damage to someone's character with untrue statements. You know, you know I- I'm just thinking about cases where someone may be accused of 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 um, as we say in local parlance, interfering with little children, mm-hmm. and and that being spread all over the place, um, verbally as well as in 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 cyberspace, and it turns mm-hmm. out to be untrue. Particularly if that person works with children for a living, maybe a teacher yeah. or Could something you like that. The damage that that, will that do person can never recover from that, no matter yeah, what yeah. the court case, um, you know, no matter how the court case turns out. Even That's if it right, turns out in their favor. You, there are parents who will say, listen, hmm, I ain't care what the court say, whether you're, they're fine, you're not guilty. I ain't trusting you with my child. Basically, that, that, that's what's going to happen, you know, in, in circumstances like that. So the damage to someone, and, and that, that's what I tell you, the, the, the insidious nature of the danger of defamation is so far and wide and you know it, it creeps into corners it you know it slips into little places that you would never think of persons who you know may be smiling at you still on a daily basis but in the back of their minds they're looking at that person and saying oh, you see that person oh, he does interfere with little boys or you know that and and this is the problem with the defamatory statements because if it is that it's not true then the damage is already done and as you said, Jessamy, once you put it out in cyberspace, it is never erased. Never, ever, ever. Don't care how many times you scrub it from your Facebook wall. Don't care how many times you scrub it from your post. The point is there are people who may have copied it, who have sent it on, and you can never It may exist it on, a, on, never, a, on a server it is. in the and South that's Pole. The and damage of it. Yeah. Now, it may exist in a server in, in the South Pole or in Vanuatu. 
Thank you. It's Thank on you. some server Thank somewhere. You. Mm-hmm. You know, I know you have to leave, Mr. George, but I, I wouldn't, it would be remiss of me if I allow you to go. And um, I saw a couple of days ago the Prime Minister is asking for a PSC to face a probe regarding the Commissioner and all the controversy. Mm-hmm. Can you, can you, you, can you enlighten us, sir, that? of all well, that we've been reading? In, in those circumstances, I would imagine that the proper course would be first to wait until that actually happens, and then I guess all will be revealed. <laughs> all right? Okay. Thanks a whole lot. And have a great morning to you all, and good morning, Trinidad and Tobago. Thanks okay. very much, Thank Martin George. Right. We've been speaking with our our uh, good friend and legal expert that we tap into from time to time, Martin George, member of the Police Service Commission and Senior Attorney at Law, here on the Breakfast Roundtable on Sky. Edison Carr, Jesse May Venture, and Dr. Wayne Haywood on the Breakfast Roundtable on Sky 99.5 FM.